I stopped by just to tell you I love you. And since you're not at home, I'm writing it to you. Elena Poniatowska, El Recado. Hi there. Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's greatest novel. Chapter 36 opens a long episodic sequence at the Ducal Palace, which spans the six chapters that precede the beginning of Sancho's governorship of his island in chapter 42. The series starts with the chivalric fantasy involving the Countess Trifaldi's conflict with the giant Malambruno and ends with the Clavileño adventure in which Don Quixote and Sancho make a cosmic ascent atop a magical wooden horse. Before any of this, however, the narrator informs us that the figures of Dulcinea and Merlin were played, respectively, by a page boy and the chief steward of the Duke's household, also known as the Mayordomo. Note the sexual confusion. In her final appearance, the hyper-beautiful Dulcinea was actually a young man. Next. We have a comical discussion between the squire and the duchess about Sancho's penitence, in which we learn that so far, Sancho has only given himself five lashes with his hand. Two other important details here. First, the duchess insists that for his lashes to be effective, Sancho must use a scourge, or cat of nine tails. Her words indicate a harsh form of pedagogy and place a high value on Dulcinea's liberty, hinting at Cervantes' vision of the purpose of his own novel. Learning requires suffering, and the liberty of such a great woman as Dulcinea cannot be obtained so cheaply. Second, the Duchess's final comment sounds harmless, but it directly contradicts the Counter-Reformation's response to Luther's doctrine of sola fide, or only faith, which challenged the Catholic view that all acts of charity lead to grace. Be advised, Sancho, that works of charity which are performed weakly or with indifference have no merit and are worthless. This is a very big deal. The phrase was censored in the Valencia edition of 1616 and expurgated from all editions between 1632 and 1839. Note also how Sancho's response alludes to the mysterious reappearance of his ass's harness in part one. Give me, my lady, the appropriate scourge or harness, and I will lash myself with that. Did you know transvestism in Don Quixote might mean many things, but it was also a typical plot device that Cervantes inherited from the Byzantine novel. See, for example, Ethiopica by Heliodorus. Next, Sancho hands the Duchess a letter that he has had someone else write to his wife, Teresa. The letter is fascinating for many reasons. First, drawing on Apuleius' The Golden Ass, it alludes to the squire's lashes in relation to his governorship, as well as the human status of his ass. If they have lashed me well, at least I have ridden well, and if I got myself a good regime, then it cost me a few lashes. And he also says, the gray is well and sends you his best, and I won't leave him even if they make me Grand Turk. Second, it reveals Sancho's greed and corruption and his quest for social status via his governorship. A governor's wife you are. And from here in a few days, I will depart from my governorship and I go there with a very great desire to make money, for they have told me that all the new governors have this same desire. Third, it refers again to the problem of the missing 100 escudos from part one. God has not seen fit to grant me another case with another 100 escudos like before, but don't let that trouble you. It'll come out in the wash of this governorship. Fourth, Sancho tells Teresa not to tell others about their good fortune because people will reach negative conclusions. If you make your business public, some will say it's white and others will say it's black. Fifth, Sancho reveals his disillusioned vision of his master as well as himself. My master, Don Quixote, according to what I have heard said in these parts, is a sane madman and a laughable idiot, and I am not far behind him. Sixth, astonishingly, Sancho dates his letter 20 July 1614. In other words, just prior to the publication of part two of Don Quixote, this represents a radical break in the timeline of the novel, which has caused 
debate among scholars. Is this another slip or is Cervantes trying to call our attention to the historical context of part two? The latter. Similarly, Sancho's governorship will refer to the expulsion of the Moriscos ordered by Philip III between 1609 and 1614. Quixotic mission. What does Sancho announce to Teresa in his letter? A, woman of a squire you are. B, whore of a viceroy you are. C, wife of the governor you are. Correct answer, C, wife of a governor you are. After she reads Sancho's letter to Teresa, the Duchess voices two objections. First, apparently forgetting the Duke's pressure on Sancho in the previous chapter and undercutting her husband's authority, she claims that Sancho's governorship is not contingent on his lashes. When my lord the Duke promised it to him, he knew nothing at all about any lashes. Her second objection cuts to the issue of greed and corruption. Greed rips the sack, and a greedy governor will dispense injustice. After lunch in the garden with the Duke and Don Quixote, we have another shocking intrusion announced by an odd mix of military and funereal music. At this moment, we're heard the melancholic tones of a flute and those of a deep and dissonant drum. Everyone seemed disturbed by the confused, martial, and sad harmony. Note how Sancho again hides in the Duchess's skirts. Fear carried him away to his customary refuge which was at the side, if not in the skirts, of the Duchess. This is comical slapstick, but there's also something here that connects relations between the sexes to political leadership. That's all for now. Join me next time as we continue interpreting the most important literary masterpiece in the Spanish language. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.